Welcome to the Data Practices webinar, uh, Data Practices Potpourri webinar with the Data Practices Office. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, the Data Practices Office is a small office in the Department of Administration, and the bulk of what we do is answer questions related to data practices and the open meeting law. We do have time for a question and answer period today, and you can send your questions in at any time. We often get more questions than we can answer, and what we do during the day, almost every day, is answer questions related to data practices and open meetings. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time. We also help the Commissioner of Administration with her responsibilities under the Data Practices Act and the Open Meeting Law with issuing advisory opinions, and we also provide legislative assistance and training. This PowerPoint is posted to our website already, so if you would like to go back and take a look at it, it's at the page where you registered, and I'll show you where that is. Uh, we also record our webinar, so if you miss part of today's and want to go back and watch it again or find it, uh, one of our prior series, you can find those on our YouTube channel, and I can show you how to find those as well. This is the homepage for the Data Practices Office. I just want to point out for those of you who um, are interested in data practices, we have a lot of information on different aspects of data practices, including different kinds of data on our website. So please check that out if you are interested. Um, in terms of finding our YouTube page, you can always scroll down to the bottom at our footer, and it's always here. Um, you can also see what we're tweeting on Twitter if you'd like to follow us there. So again, the YouTube link is always in our footer. You can find it on any page. If we scroll back up to the top under events and webinars, if you go to the page where you registered for today's webinar, um, you will find another link to our YouTube channel. I also wanna point out if you're having any audio issues, you can read our audio FAQs here. Additionally, um, scrolling down, you will find the PowerPoints for all of our webinars. So again, if you want to go back and take a look, um, you can do that. And today's PowerPoint is already listed here, so you can get a copy there. So going to our YouTube channel, I just want to point out where you can find some of these videos. Um, right here at the top, you can see the different playlists. There are all of the data practices potpourri videos. We did a series on law enforcement data and personnel data. Those are two of the um, most frequently asked about aspects of data practices. Uh, we have an open, a series on open meeting law and some general uh, data practices on open meeting videos. Um, we also have a video that we did about the open meeting law and virtual meetings, if you want to take a look at that. And there's also a video on data practices and the open meeting law uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can take a look at those if you are interested. I am going to share a copy of the PowerPoint now, if you would like to download it, if um, again, it's on our website, if you want to uh, find it at a later time. A pop up should uh, pop up on your screen and you can select the PowerPoint and save it to the device that you are using. So today is the fourth installment of Data Practices Potpourri. Um, we an opportunity to hear what issues the data that data requesters and government entities uh, called us or emailed us about this month. Um, as usual, we'll leave some time for a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. You can send your questions in at any time. So if you have a question right now, you can uh, type it in right now to the Q&A panel and please remember to send it to all panelists so that we can be sure to see them. I'll also put up the PowerPoint later in the presentation again for anybody who missed it this time around. We have a few general data practices questions to begin with today. We often get questions about uh, minors and access to data by minors. Um, this is one that we received this month. A government entity has private data about an individual who is a minor at the time of collection. The data subject is now 18. Their parent would like access to the data. Should the entity provide access? Uh, generally, no. Uh, while a data subject is a minor, a parent or guardian can generally have access to private data about the child, 
subject to the exceptions that we're going to talk about. But once a child becomes an adult, the parents and guardians no longer have the right to access their child's data. Um, as I noted, there are some exceptions to, to these rights. Uh, first, minors may ask entities to have their private data withheld from their parents, and government entities have to make that decision based on the circumstances. So that's a limitation on a parent's right to get access to their minor child's data or information. An exception to that general requirement and the general requirement that parents get access um, is educational data. So some parents can have access to their child's educational data even after the child becomes an adult, and minor students cannot ask for their data to be withheld from their parents unless they've been in some way emancipated or their parents have um, had their rights terminated. So educational data is an exception to the general rule that parents can get access and they cannot get access after their child turns 18. Another question we received was, how long must a government entity wait before closing a data request when the requester does not respond to follow up questions for clarifications or to notification that the request is complete? The Data Practices Act does not provide specific guidance on what to do in the case of an abandoned request, um, either at the clarification part of the process or after the responsive data has been compiled. The law does require access policies and internal procedures to ensure that requests are responded to in an appropriate and prompt manner. So as part of those policies or procedures, government entities can consider having a process for abandoned requests. Um, at minimum, I think it's a good practice for government entities to document that you're attempting to fulfill the request or asking for clarification um, and letting the data requester know that the data are ready. If you don't hear back, uh, providing a letter, which also serves as your documentation uh, for a government entity, um, that gives the date when the entity will consider the request abandoned and then closed would also be helpful. So you can incorporate those into the access policies that you already have if you're a government entity, um, or you can have them as part of your internal procedures for responding to requests. I think that reasonable reasonableness should always be the guiding standard. So giving a requester 24 hours to respond might not be appropriate or fair. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I don't think that you necessarily need to give a requester six months to get back to uh, you for clarification. So if a government entity is at the clarification stage, um, I also think it's helpful if you include the letter or the email asking for clarification um, that you will wait to begin compiling the responsive data until you've heard from the requester. And that's um, just a, a part of letting government be efficient. Um, if there's a request that's going to be abandoned rather than doing all the work on the front end, um, waiting until you get that clarification. So you know, as the government entity, what your obligations are and what you're actually looking for. So entities can set some internal timelines for clarification, follow up, and eventually closing the request. Um, I did see this month uh, in, in an access policy for a city that they have included that if they don't hear from a requester within uh, 10 days of notifying them that the request is ready, um, that they will consider it closed. So that's something that government entities can consider and something that data requesters should be aware of. Another general question we received is, uh, or discussed this, this month was, when a data subject has given their consent to a third party to receive copies of data, how much can government charge the third party? Um, and the answer to this is found in section 1305 subdivision four. Paragraph B says, or I'm sorry, paragraph D says that private data can be used and disseminated when the data subject gives informed consent. That needs to be written written informed consent. Um, and then it says the responsible authority may require a person requesting copies under this paragraph with informed consent to pay the actual costs of making and certifying the copies. Um, and so the language in this provision in 1305 is the same as the language in section 1304 regarding data subjects rights. So our guidance would therefore be that entities can charge similar to how they would charge a data subject and cannot charge to search and retrieve. So remember that copy costs are permissive and government uh, entities do not need to charge. Um, if government entities are charging, it is helpful to include in your access policies how you will be um, how you'll be charging and how you'll be making those decisions. 
We routinely get questions related to records management, and a number of years ago, our office had a records manager on staff, uh, but due to, to a legislative change in the early 2000s, uh, the funding for that position went away, and we no longer have that uh, records manager in-house. So we do the best we can with general questions, uh, but remember for government entities, you can always go to the state archive staff to ask questions about retention schedules and official records as well. One of the questions we received this month was, do I need to fill out a destruction report when I delete or destroy government data? So if you are deleting government general government data that are not official records, then government entities do not need to fill out destruction reports. Um, when destroying official records on the records retention schedule, then entities must fill out a destruction report. So again, if it's an official record on the records retention schedule and the time has passed and now you can destroy the record, um, government entities should, must uh, uh, fill out a records uh, destruction report at that time. Government entities do not need to send those forms or reports to the state archives or to our office. Some of the older forms do have our contact information on there and says to send them to us. You do not need to do that. Um, government entities should just maintain those destruction reports for their own records. We receive questions from law enforcement agencies about maltreatment and abuse uh, investigations fairly regularly. These are some of the more challenging data practices questions because they involve multiple data subjects whose data are private. Um, a lot of those subjects are known to each other, and this is just a very sensitive um, area and, and issue to deal with. A common question that we receive might look like this. Mom reported that dad abused their child. Police investigate for possible criminal activity and no charges are filed. The case is now closed. Dad requests access to the police file. What can he access? So for the answer, we look to section 1382, which is comprehensive law enforcement data and subdivisions eight and nine relate to uh, child maltreatment or child abuse data. Subdivision eight classifies active or inactive data that identify a victim or alleged victim of maltreatment as private. And subdivision nine classifies inactive investigative data for cases that do not result in charges or where the statute of limitations has run as private. Investigative data that become inactive after appeal rights are exhausted, however, are treated as required by 1382 subdivision seven, which means that some of the investigative data that is not identifying the child will become public in that limited circumstance. So in our scenario here, no charges were filed. So subdivisions eight and nine come into play. Um, identifying data about the child, dad, and mom are private. Um, data identifying a reporter of child abuse would be confidential. Uh, additionally, as we learned about in the first question today, parents have the right to access information about their minor children, unless there's a court order limiting their rights, like a termination of parental rights. So dad can have access to information about him and his child. Dad about others needs to be redacted. Again, these are challenging situations because um, all of the individuals involved generally know each other even uh, when they've been redacted. Um, so entities and law enforcement agencies need to make some difficult decisions to make sure they're providing appropriate access to the requester while also protecting other identify, uh, identified individuals. Um, again, these are challenging, and so if you have one of these and you just want to talk through some of the decision points, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to have that discussion with you. Another law enforcement data question we received was, what is the classification of telephone numbers in police reports? So some data are always public, even when there is an active criminal investigation. However, telephone numbers are not included in those data elements. That means that the classification depends on whether there's an active investigation and whether there is a protected identification. If there's an active investigation, then telephone numbers are confidential while the investigation is active. If the investigation is inactive or there wasn't an investigation, it wasn't, didn't rise to the level of a criminal investigation, then phone numbers are public unless they would reveal, reveal a protected identity under section 1382 subdivision 17. We talk more about protected identities in our series on law enforcement data. So if you'd like to learn more, um, you can take a listen to those recordings. 
And finally, uh, a question on personnel data to round out our questions today. Is every occurrence of a public employee's name personnel data about that employee? No, um, names of employees are not automatically personnel data on that employee. Um, per, to, in order to be personnel data, data have to be data on individuals, which means there is an identifiable, the employee is the identifiable subject of the data. But if the name is merely incidental, then it's not data on individuals. If it's not data on individuals, it cannot be personnel data. Um, personnel, personnel data also have to be maintained because the individual is an employee, applicant, volunteer, or independent contractor. So if they're maintained for other reasons, then it is not necessarily personnel data. And for those of you making those decisions or wanting to see analysis about that, you want to take a look at the KSTP versus Met Council case from the Supreme Court. So some examples just to uh, apply that would be performance reviews. Uh, performance reviews are really about the employee being re reviewed, even though the supervisor's name is probably listed on there. Um, in that case, even though the, uh, the supervisor might be giving his or her opinion about the employee, um, that employee uh, performance evaluation is about the employee and not the uh, reviewer. Um, emails about work reports or presentations. Uh, for instance, if my name appeared in this presentation because I wrote it, um, my name would really be incidental because this is a this is about the work. This is about data practices. It's not really about me as an employee, um, and therefore this per, this presentation is not personnel data. So just because an employee's name appears somewhere does not automatically make that data personnel data. So now we have some time for questions. I think some have been coming in. Um, if you Here's some silence on our end. That's just us taking a look at the questions and, and going through them um, so that we can answer them. Um, but please send them in. Feel free to continue sending them in. All right, so we have some questions in the chat. Um, the first question is, if a government entity paid money to get records, uh, for instance, medical records, can that cost later be charged to someone seeking that data now retained by the entity? Um, so there are a couple of different aspects of this question. I think the first one is no, you can't charge for the cost uh, that the entity uh, paid to uh, conduct its own business. That wouldn't be considered a response um, to the data request. That would have been a charge that the entity paid in order to complete some other official business uh, for the entity. That wouldn't be part of the response to the data request. Um, something to note here is you specifically mentioned medical records. Um, when medical records are provided directly to a government entity from a healthcare provider, the Minnesota Health Records Act actually um, restricts redistribution of those records without informed consent. And so medical records uh, obtained directly from a healthcare provider have some additional protections on them that um, are important to be aware of. Okay, uh, and we do have another question here. Uh, when destroying old, how specific should we be, or should you be? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, uh, specific means on here. Um, and this might be a good question for, for the state archives to check in with them uh, when it comes to some of these records management issues. You know, it, if you're, it's filling out the destruction report, uh, you'd obviously want to be, you know, specific enough to be aware of what records were destroyed, so maybe certain time periods, uh, and certain types of files, um, because once you destroy those records, that that uh, records destruction report basically is the record of what might might have existed. And so, certainly, you would want to have enough information there to you know determine what was destroyed uh, from that perspective. But that would certainly be a, a question that I would suggest reaching out to the, the state archives just to check in with them uh, for some guidance there too.
And we have a question about traveling data. The question is, if a welfare agency receives law enforcement reports as part of a child abuse investigation, does the law enforcement report become welfare data and then subject to 1346 and not 1382? So that is how the traveling data uh, provision in the uh, Data Practices Act works. If uh, an entity receives government data from another government entity, the receiving the data at the receiving entity um, will retain the classification at the sending entity if the receiving entity doesn't have its own classification. But when that receiving entity already has its own classification for the data that it received, um, that is the classification that controls. And so um, here the uh, welfare agency has its own classification for the data it received under 1346, and that would be the controlling uh, classification in that case. We'll give you a few more minutes to um, ask any other questions in the Q&A panel. Um, we don't have any other ones at the moment. To follow up on that last question too about um, the interplay between law enforcement and um, welfare agencies related to maltreatment investigations, you wanna take a look at chapter 260E as an elephant. Um, 260E lays out um, how that information moves and then how it's classified. So at at the welfare agency, it would be private data, um, the law enforcement data, but at the law enforcement agency, it would be classified under 1382. Um, again, largely a lot of that is private, but it will depend on the disposition of the case. While we're waiting for any other questions to come in, I'm just going to open uh, our polling panel um, that has a little survey of our presentation today. Um, so if you'd be willing to fill that out and enter any other questions that you have in the chat while we're waiting, that'd be great. Okay, so we have a couple more questions here. Uh, so one is, how would you handle neighbors calling on each other for noise complaints uh, and knocking on walls? <clears throat> would this can be considered the same as noise and uh, barking dog complaints? Um, yeah, I, I think that's really kind of, you know, you would need to consider how you're going to be handling that question or how, how you'd be handling that complaint. And, you know, certainly it could be possible that it could be a, a property data complaint. And so what you'd want to take a look at is uh, section 13.44, uh, where some of the data about a complainant would technically be uh, confidential uh, in, in that situation. And so you would, you know, if you receive a data request uh, for that complaint, um, you would, you know, have to uh, withhold the, the complainant's name in, in that aspect. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I think it would be kind of up to your determination to some extent to, you know, determine what type of complaint that is. Um, but it is entirely possible that it could be a, a property complaint under 13.44 in that situation. 
Yeah, and to add on to that, with that property complaint section, um, it says that the identity of individuals who register the complaint, so the person who complains, it's their identity that's confidential. Um, and it's confidential when they make a, a complaint regarding real property uh, concerning violations of state laws or local ordinances. And so you just want to review that section 13.44, subdivision one make sure that that complaint actually fits within that section and then if it does that's when you would um, consider the complainant's identity uh, confidential um, we have another question if a city has a data request form can they require a requester to complete it before responding to the request so this is um, something that would be addressed by the government entities data access procedures so the city in its data access policies might say we have this form and um, this is how you make a data request for our entity. It, it might not be um, uh, a best practice to require a specific form, but some entities do require you go through a portal. Some entities require that you simply send the request in writing, which, which would be a best practice. We typically say that entities should put in their policies that data requests be in writing. So that way you as an entity are able to track the data request, um, go back and review it and make sure that you responded appropriately. Um, and then, uh, but some entities just simply require that you email the request uh, to a specific individual at the entity um, and they have a list of the designees or appropriate recipients. Um, so it's kind of up to your access policies to determine how you will accept the request and in what form. So we do have another question, <clears throat> excuse me, here. Uh, under court services data 13.84 subdivision 5D, can proba <clears throat> probation share private and confidential information with a social services data? I'm not quite sure, maybe an agent, a social services employee. And so when you're looking at 13.84 subdivision 5 does state the different reasons that a court services data can be shared. Um, you know, private or confidential court services data shall not be disclosed except, and then, you know, under, you know, paragraph D there does say, uh, or to county personnel within the welfare system. So there may be situations that you could, you know, be sharing that data, but, you know, if there's a specific situation that you're, you're thinking about, um, certainly feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to, you know, talk you through some of those, those considerations. Okay, so those were some of our top questions this month. I've put up the PowerPoint again for anybody who missed it the first time around. You can select it and then save it to your device. Um, 
We have an introduction to data practices, policies, and procedures workshop coming up on March 17th. So if you need a refresher or if you have any new folks in your office uh, who might need training, please feel free to register for that. Um, you can find that information on our website. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you again, and thank you for joining us today.